that this was not any ordinary genre show. This was actually going to be something very special. You know, I think there were sort of layers of it, Sean, because mm. um, interpersonally amongst the cast members, we all felt an immediate synergy with one another. That first read through standing, you know, sitting around the table, Eddie and Mary there, Ron Moore there, David Icke, and hearing all those parts being spoken, uh, it already came alive and off the page during the read through. Uh, so that was kind of the first mo moment of like, oh, wow, like everybody is bringing their A game. All these people um, are so invested in this character. This writing is, this writing is, um, uh, is spectacular. Um, and I remember Eddie standing up at that read through and just saying, you know, kids, you are in this for the long haul. This is the beginning. Um, and then we started shooting and, you know, for me as a young actor at the time, there's a lot of exciting things, these built sets, they're totally 360 degree sets. Uh, you're starting to see the kind of production value <laughs> involved in this. Um, but it really hit home to me going to Los Angeles. Uh, I've said it before, uh, I was sharing a hotel room with uh, Tom O'Pennicott and Alonzo Oyarzin. Uh, we were staying at the Mondrian on the Sunset Strip, and we were there for press junket. Um, and driving to the hotel, there was Eddie's face down the side of, of the building, down Sunset Boulevard. And I was like, wait a second, what is going on? I'm Canadian. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, I mean, every day on set was, it was like theater. We all, we all put our suits on. We all knew what we came to do. And once you were on the set, you know, the writers were there. A lot of the time, the first year, Ron was there a lot of the time. And you wanted to be on set because you had that access and that communication. And I didn't have a point of comparison because um, I was still so young and I hadn't had that much on set experience um, at the time. But I've come to learn how rare that situation is. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, it, it felt special from the beginning. That's something all the actors all bring up about working on Battlestar, how special it was, and especially the vibe I understand that Edward James Olmos and Mary McDonald brought to the set and camaraderie that they brought to it in terms of the work ethic as well. Mm. And quite stern about it as well. Mm. well they were definitely like, they are both so warm and lovely. Mary is hilarious, as many of your <laughs> people watching here will know if you're lucky enough to have met her at one of your conventions. She is warm and funny and uh, just kind of wraps you up in her, the energy that's around her. Um, but Eddie set a, a very clear precedent of work ethic um, mm -hmm. and collaboration from the beginning for all of us. I heard, is it true that uh, uh when you were filming the mini series that Eddie improvised the So Say We All yes. scene. Yeah. And that became pretty iconic. Mm -hmm. I say it almost every day, like every day. <laughs> <laughs> answering, uh, you know, messages or doing cameo or something. So Say We All is, I mean, think of uh, like, it's not really a catchphrase, but I guess, yeah, catchphrase, iconic catchphrases of, of TV shows. So say we all is so recognizable. I mean, you know, to say Eddie improv anything, uh, Eddie is very thoughtful and incredibly prepared. Um, and also gives over to the moment. It was such an intense day, I remember, because we shot that for fairly early on. Um, I remember it being the first time that I got to be in a scene with other, sorry, there's a bus going by, um, <laughs> a scene with other actors that I'd seen at the read-throughs, you know, but I'd never had a chance to actually interact with them on camera. We were all in our, I'm so sorry, I live in like the noisiest part of town. <laughs> um, I not hear any of it. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's the first time I, you know, and. Uh, some of the like the pilots were in their their dress uh, uniforms. 
Um, so we got to kind of experience that. Um, there were so many extras on, on set that day, background performers. It, there were so many moving parts. And it was also such a meaningful moment um, in, in the context of the show, but also just kind of what was going on in the world. You know, there was war on television. There, you know, as BSG did, sort of paralleled uh, these kind of real world um, experiences. And to be at a kind of a, yeah, uh, standing up in a, in, in a military, um, I, I don't even know what to call that, formation <laughs> with, you know, with our, with our leader, even the way we were lined up, like they checked us that we were in proper ranking order, that we were, you know, standing up straight, all that training that we did that first week before we started shooting, um, that we all knew how to salute properly. And we were immersed in that experience. Like Eddie knew that he had everybody in that crowd, hook, line, and sinker, the true professional that he was. He, um, I remember there not being a great deal of interruption from camera or the director or, you know, the sort of peripheral, you, you could lose the sense that you were on a set and you could really give yourself over to being there. And people were emotional. Obviously it's, you know, we're, we're talking about um, people fallen and, and how to go on. And um, I mean, listen, the casting of Eddie for that role, I think, <laughs> Who else could have played that role? Do you know anybody else who played that role? <laughs> so how did you get the role of Duala when you got cast on it? And how much did they tell you about the character and the overall arc of the show? Hmm? I think I got it by mistake. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I think it was a mistake. No. Um, some of your fans might know the story. I was on my way to Los Angeles. My agents had finally convinced me to go to Los Angeles to go for pilot season. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. Packed up my car. I was going to drive down. My agent called and said, hey, there's this audition. It's a mini series. It might go. It's a small role. Um, it's just an actor part, 10 lines. Uh, but it'll be some good money in your pocket. You know, it's, it's a network show. So you'll have some walking around money for you in Los Angeles. And I was like, great. Um, the sides did not make sense to me. I was not speaking to anybody. I was, uh, speaking into a radio and it was all squawk. Um, uh, I, I was basically refueling, uh, one of the Raptors. So I'm speaking to the pilot. I'm telling them how close they're coming to the, to the ship when they're allowed to dock. Is everybody okay? But yeah. Cup it like yeah, coming in yeah. Karam nine four three five like I didn't know what I was saying. Michael Reimer was in the room, uh, warm and lovely. But that was basically it. Uh, I walked in. I said hi. Um, he looked at my resume. Uh, I asked who I was speaking to. He said, "Speak straight to camera." That was very weird for me. This is the first time I did that. Um, he he gave me a bit of direction. Uh, in terms of like setting where I was and who I was, I was speaking to the pilots and uh, I speak to them all the time. They depend on me. They depend on this voice. And that was it. I did it straight to camera. They were like, great. That's great, Candace. Thank you so much. Actors don't believe directors when they tell you great mm -hmm. things very much. That's <laughs> it's like the brush off. Um, and I literally got in the car and drove to LA. <laughs> Um, I was there for a couple of weeks. Um, I was rooming with Tomo Pennicut again. Uh, oh, wow. Tomo and I have been roommates a lot mm. <laughs> throughout the years. Um, and then, yeah, two weeks later, they were like, come back. You're on the show. I think, and I think it was during the course of the mini series, and Eddie can correct me if I'm wrong, but I do attribute uh, the initial conversations about the growth of my character to him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I am one of the few 
actors of color on that show. Um, to me, that's a bit of a misnomer because there are a lot of actors of color on that show, <laughs> like me, Eddie, Grace, uh, Alessandro, like we're, we're all uh, we're all BIPOC people. But I guess in terms of my demographic, um, and I know that that Eddie had been advocating for that early on. It was important to him that the show uh, reflect the population um, appropriately, um, and. Yeah, I, I didn't know they were watching me. I was just happy to have a job. It was very cool. Uh, I was around a lot of cool people. I got to meet Eddie and Mary. Um, they were lovely. And I was just really happy about like the paycheck and the comfortable costume, <laughs> like getting to experience it. Um, I went back to LA after we shot that mini series and yeah, got the call again. Uh, that they wanted me back because I was she wasn't supposed to come back. She wasn't. Mm. Duvala was just she was the voice. Well, yeah. Sometimes that's a real a nice indication that you've done a good job when somebody's brought in for a guest star role and then they make that permanent on a show. That's, <laughs> that's really them saying you did a good job, so we want you to stick around. Um, I'll try and take the compliment. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> So does it surprise you now looking back and you look at it that the show still remains so popular and rev uh, relevant? And do you think, how much do you think it affected your career going forward after Battlestar Galactica finished? Um, that show changed my life. And that is not an understatement. It completely changed the trajectory of my life and of my career. I hesitate to say this because uh, there there is such there is such great stuff on television, and um, I've been a part of some awesome shows since, uh, and I hope to continue to do so. But I remember him saying also, like, it's all downhill from here. <laughs> He's like, I've been in this game fifty years, and this is the best piece of television I have ever been on, and and we were all like, what? <laughs> We're like, Eddie, I'm 25, don't say that. <laughs> but um, but he was sort of right. You know, the show came up at a point where that kind of episodic television was still very new. Um, the show set a precedent for that and engaged audiences in a way that they hadn't been really before. I think there was like six feet under and then us <laughs> uh, at the time. Um, Technically, it was uh, so advanced. And I remember in the beginning, like the shooting style and the early critic reviews, they had a lot to say about it. it ended up now being, you know, made a formula <laughs> for other shows. Um, and in terms of my life, I mean, I know these people. I get to talk to you. I get to, uh, well, used to be able to travel around the world meeting fans. But <laughs> we'll be back for that next year. Oh, I really hope so. Um, I miss the cons. <laughs> um, I meet people every day who tell me how the show affected them, affected their lives personally. And, I, you know, that's part of the magic of it to me because people engage with it in this really broad kind of humanistic way where it's talking about uh, politics and government and all these kind of parallel socio-political things that are going on in the world. And it creates this platform for oftentimes really difficult conversations um, in these broad ways. But then it, it also touches people and people engage with it so personally. People tell me, um, obviously my character had the end that she did and, and uh, made the deci decisions that she did. And listen, it's not a, it's not a rom-com BSG. <laughs> yeah, that was apparent. But you know, those moments of, hey, I was recovering from a really bad accident and I was watching BSG, or I had a really difficult relationship with my father, but we were able to watch this show and it opened up a door of communication to us. Hey, um, you know, my, my brother committed suicide and I never understood what that 
meant. And here I had an example of, you know, kind of a compassionate approach to that decision. And it's amazing to me that it continues, it's sort of not amazing, that it stands the test of time, that that, um, that soulful nature of it uh, is still present and is still captivating people. Every day on my Instagram, there are people that are telling me I'm re-watching it. I got my girlfriend to watch it. I'm watching it for the first time. It's 20 years, 20 years. And people are still watching the show for the first time or for the 20th time. Yeah. <laughs> As I said, they've just launched it again over here. So there's going to be a whole, I think there's going to be a whole bunch of new fans potentially for the show in the UK. So and absolutely. And absolutely. Because it does stand up, you know, against these other shows. Um, and I'm so, so so proud of that. Humbled by it because I do feel like I played a very small role in that. You know, I was given the opportunity that I got to play in that vein, but I am, it is, yeah, it was one of the most uh, profound experiences of my life. And the fact that it continues to give 20 years later, continues to support me, continues to uh, be a foot in the door, to other experiences, other rooms that I walk into, um, that people have such love <laughs> for this show and, and share that love with me without knowing me just because I'm a part of it um, is remarkable. What other shows are like that? I don't know. Very few. Mm. <laughs> so since appearing on Battlestar, you've done a lot of other genre shows. Uh, you're a regular on Jeremiah. You're regular on Hemlock Grove, and V Wars, Ghost Wars. Uh, you guest starred on Andromeda, Supernatural, and you recently did an episode of The New Charmed, didn't you? So yes. I was yeah. just wondering what your own opinions are. You a fan of the genre yourself? What you feel about the genre, and what it is about you that casting directors for the genre are drawn to? Do you think it's a BSG thing, or do you think you've got a certain quality that appeals for sci-fi and fantasy? Hmm. I wonder. Yes. Yes, I have been in a lot of shows about fighting supernatural beings. Yeah. Lots of Cylons and lots, lots of vampires and werewolves as well. The whole gamut. I think, I think, I, I think I've got bingo right. Like, yeah, absolutely. There. Vampires, ghosts. <laughs> Needs to throw some ectoplasm in there, and we're golden. Um, I think I'm hard to place. I think earlier on, I'm just. I think I was really hard to place. Hmm. Um, before this kind of opening up in and diversity conversation in terms of um, casting. And it was so funny. I was actually discussing this with my friend last night. Like if you, I was watching fame mm. last night and uh, casting was incredibly diverse. Like the, the group of people in that cast uh, reflected the population of, of what they were trying to show. Um, and then somewhere in the 90s, and I don't know, something happened. <laughs> yeah, I was talking with some friends last year when they did the uh, the Buffy reunion photo shoot. And we were looking at that and we were kind of like going, it was a great show, but you wouldn't have a cast like that anymore. <laughs> like, yeah, what, what happened? Um, and now it's, you know, it's, it's sort of coming back. But there was a long time there where I wasn't getting breakdowns for anybody that was described that looked like me, right? I was going in for the roles of like the redheads or boys. <laughs> I went in for a lot of male roles when I first started. Oh, out Julia. <laughs> um, because they just didn't know what to do with me. You know, I could never have parents because who were they going to cast as my parents? Like to be ethnically ambiguous at the time was a bit of a double-edged sword. And I think, but there was a room. There was room for me in genre. And if you look at those roles, you know, Ghost Wars and, and Hemlock Grove. Um, thankfully, I had a lovely storyline with Malcolm Jamal Warner and Jeremiah, and that was that was great. Uh, and Kim Hawthorne on that show uh, was incredible. But um, so I, I've played a lot of lone wolves <laughs> because I never had parents and I never had children. <laughs> um, and then. Back in the 90s and early 2000s, there was kind of a weird thing about who I could be in a romantic relationship with. I mean, 
I'm sorry to speak out of school, but it was really true. Like I basically had somebody tell me Superman will never have a black girlfriend. Like <laughs> it's just not going to happen though. It's changed. <laughs> thankfully. Um, it's changed for the better now. So, and they figured it out and exactly. Um, but yeah, back in the day, it was just like, well, I sort of had to be in genre because it was the only place that I could mm. exist. Like I needed to be in space or I needed to be a lone hunter or I needed to be some quirky scientist. Like there was no, um, you couldn't attach me to anybody. Um, now it's very different. I also love genre. I do love fantasy. As, as a person, I love fantasy. I grew up, my aunt, um, Shout out Obling, it's my Auntie Andrea. <laughs> she introduced me to sci-fi um, and fantasy novels. Um, and as a kid, you know, I'm an only child, so I spent a lot of time kind of in my imagination and that lends itself to that world. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, I love that you can also kind of do incredible things. Uh, that was the great thing about BSGs. You could talk about these things. You could talk about challenging things uh, challenging subjects, personal experiences, but because they were in space and in the future, it kind of uh, took down people's guards about it, and they were open. They were open to it more, you know. And that's why we got the first interracial kiss on camera. Nichelle Nichols and uh, William Shatner was in space. Yep, it's the only place it could be. <laughs> I love Mr. Nichols, by the way. <laughs> I've hung out with her a few times. Uh, I'll tell you those stories next time I see you. Listen, <laughs> she doesn't suffer any foolishness, I can tell you that. <laughs> now, we've got two questions here. It's pretty much the same question, but Rick Nelson from Suffolk and Jules Harley from Brighton, they both ask about you leaving the show, and they wanted to know how far in advance were you made aware of Dee's fate? on the show uh it was quite a surprising very emotional ending and how did you feel about it when you found out i was heartbroken mm. I was absolutely heartbroken um i did not know a great deal in advance mm. um it you know it was that final season we knew things were wrapping up and they really like closed everything off uh, yeah. storylines were really limited to who was involved, even within the cast. You, you, we didn't get, um, you really had to be sort of top fold in order to get those advanced scripts. You had to sign all kinds of things and be sworn to secrecy and give them your firstborn. So, um, but it's a funny story because I came back to work, um, yeah. after hiatus, the beginning of the season, <laughs> all chipper. And I walked into the hair and makeup trailer and the key hair person was like, oh, hey, oh. Oh, no. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> and he was like, oh, 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 you haven't read the script. Hmm. Um, and he gave me his white production draft. And I went to my room and I read it and listen, it's a beautifully written script. Mm. Um, I, I cried reading it. Um, and even though I read it and shot it, even when I see it, it's still, I don't know. It's still a surprise, you know? Um, but I was mad. <laughs> I was mad at Ron Moore, and um, I, you know, it's it's a weird feeling because I could see, I could see how it was in service of the show, mm. and I understood um, the role that Duala needed to play in service of the story. That aspect of humanity needed to be portrayed in that context because it was a very real thing. Um, and I was both, and I was honored, which is a strange thing to say, but I was honored that I was chosen hmm. because, because it's difficult. 
And I understood why, because Duala's death would be meaningful to a lot of those characters and would motivate them into other actions. So in terms of the service to story, I completely understood. Um, but I like went to Mary and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, they didn't even tell me. <laughs> like, so soon. Like, can I get another couple? Of, I'm not even going to be here at the end. And like, I was just mad that I wasn't going to get to hang out with everybody mm. all season. I wasn't going to get to be there for that last moment, you know, on set uh, when it all wrapped up and we'd been together for all these years. Um, and it felt a little unceremonious at the time, mm -hmm. uh, but Ron called me and was just so calm and grounded and caring as as he always is, um, and calmed me down. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> you know, I said all the lovely things and and really just listened to me and let me be a total brat to him on the phone. <laughs> I couldn't see you being a brat. Oh, I was a huge brat. I was just like, Ron. <laughs> like, I totally get it, but like, you could have called me and like, I just feel like, mm. <laughs> all my feelings. Uh, and he listened to all of them and was so gracious. And, and then it was great. And even the way they structured the shooting of the episode, uh, we did it essentially chronologically Hmm. Um, so that me shooting myself was actually the last thing that I did. And I remember um, Michael Nankin directed that episode. Thank you, Mr. Nankin. Um, and he was just so reverent hmm. about the whole process. Very unobtrusive. It was almost like he wasn't there. But that last moment, um, so, you know, shoot yourself. Uh, and I'm laying down on the floor, and we have to shoot the part where Gaeta comes over and everybody comes around, and you sort of see the, the pool of blood. Spoiler alert, by the way. Also, if you're watching this and you don't haven't seen that, I don't know what to tell you. I, I, I would assume everybody has seen it several times. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think we've jumped the shark on that one. Yeah. Um, um, but I remember because um, the fake blood that they use, like I couldn't get up and down. Hmm. So once it happened, I had to lay there while they set up the other shot, and they were you know fast about it. But I remember nobody coming on to set, like it was only the camera person um, and the focus puller. Uh, so it remained. It remained those quarters, right? It wasn't a, it wasn't a TV set. It was it was our quarters. Um, and he kind of gave me a moment lying there, <laughs> and I could see myself reflected mm. uh, in the blood on the floor. And um, yeah, when that was done, I, I walked off the set, and that was. That was my last day. Um, and I went home and I cried. Aww. Because I was going to miss everybody. You know? It was a good time. It was a really, really special place. Now, Kirsty McCran from Swindon, uh, she, she, she's a big shipper for Dee and Dilly. And she says they're one of the most adorable couples she ever remembers on television. And she wants to know how you felt about how their story ended. I was mad about that too. <laughs> <laughs> it was so sudden. I was fully gearing up for it too. Cause like, like that whole line of like, oh, we, they got, they, we better start having babies, Mary says, and then cuts to the two of us. And we're like all starry eyed lovers. And I was like, this is going to be great. <laughs> We have that whole like date scene where I got to get dressed up and my hair is all out and like all cozy in the movie theater. And like, I was like, oh, this is gonna be great. Like, okay, Paul Campbell is so tall and I am so short. So the logistics of shooting us together all the time, if you notice, I'm always on stairs or I'm sitting down or he's in front of my console in the CIC. Um, 
they used to build ramps for me if we had walk and talks. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then all of a sudden, like he gets shot and I, I was like, what? what the? I thought I was gonna lose my job. I was like, oh, well, that's it. Like that was my storyline. And uh, I, you know, they can just bring me in for like four hours of ADR to do all the ship stuff. So, like, I was pretty sure that I was next. <laughs> Um, but, but then they hooked you up with the show Sex Symbol, so kind of like that pretty much guarantees you'd be staying around. Mm. So there was a moment that I remember, and like I, we didn't really know what was going on, but we were aware mm. that the writers were on set quite a bit. And I remember I had a scene, uh, there's a walk and talk where I, I speak to Apollo, mm -hmm. um, and he turns around, and I totally check out his butt. And I like play with my ponytail. <laughs> I remember doing that. And um, I don't know, there was a part of me that was like, no, that would never happen. Like, why would Apollo end up with D? Like he's in love with Kira, like all these things. Or that that wouldn't last or, you know. But I remember being kind of cheeky and doing that the one day. Mm. Also, was, sorry, Carrie. Um, Jamie Bamber has a great vibe. <laughs> um, I won't say it <laughs> before I get myself in real trouble. <laughs> um, but I remember doing that and kind of being like, oh, well, you know, that won't really go anywhere. And then I started seeing it in the scripts and I was like, oh, it was the first time that I realized that the, the reason the writers were on set because they were watching us and they were watching kind of the storylines and the chemistry in real life as a way to continue to write them. Um, and yeah, that was fun. But Tony Stevenson, who you may, who may know as Tony the Cylon at conventions. Hi, Tony. Uh, he asks, uh, on Battlestar, there was a great mix of both young and experienced actors. So who did you learn the most from while you were there? And was there anybody there that you wished that you'd had more of a chance to work with? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so many things. I learned work, eth work ethic and the... And Eddie gave us the permission to be very serious about our jobs. Hmm. Um, Mary uh, taught me levity. That once you're prepared, you can actually just give it all away once you're there, you know? Um, Michael Hogan showed me what character embodiment was because who Colonel Ty was and who Michael Hogan was, <laughs> or is it like they they were two different people, you know, um, Michael Hogan is so funny. <laughs> um, and Ty was so, so serious and complicated and layered. Um, I felt like, you know, Alessandro, I had a compatriot in, mm. um, Aaron Douglas, taught me risk taking because uh, he would just, you know, he had an idea in his mind and he would just come onto set and, and do it. He wouldn't ask for anybody's permission about it. He would just do it and they would love it. And I was like, oh, you can do that. <laughs> you, can, like, <laughs> you can have your own ideas and do it between action and cut. Um, I wish I had, well, I always wish I had more time with Paul. Um, Paul Campbell. He was just so excellent on the show. Uh, I wish we saw more of the friendship uh, uh, between Hilo and Boomer and Duala. Um, I also learned a great deal from Katie. You know, Katie at the time, actually everybody, Trisha is playing these multiple characters. 
And although there's consistency in all of them, in terms of them being uh, six, each of them are distinct. Yeah. Uh, Katie came on that set and just like focused. I watched this woman. She would she would be on the lot at 5 a.m. working out. Mm. She would work out during lunch. Always prepared, always ready when she came on set and like fun about it. <laughs> you know, she's teasing and ribbing people. She's embodying that character on and off camera. We we're all so young, <laughs> like of that group, you know, Trisha and I were talking about this the other day. It's like, we were there in our twenties. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I wish I had gotten, I guess in terms of the storyline, I wish I'd seen more of the relation, like the friendships that Duala had and the connection that she had to the rest of the ship, because clearly she did. Um, and then in terms of, uh, well, James Callis is always just a hoot, right? Anytime yeah. I had things with him, it was always just hilarious. And he would ad, ad lib things. Uh, you never knew what was going to come out of his mouth or like when it was going to happen. And that was thrilling. Because <laughs> you really had to be on your toes. Um, and I always wanted to like, is there, I always wanted to do, um, yeah, just kind of more of that because uh, I came from such a back, like I'd been taught to be so prepared. And not that he wasn't prepared, but he, like he would just, he just throw things. He would just do things. Uh, mm -hmm. And you have to kind of go with it. And so much of that created magic uh, on camera. Uh, Tony also asks, there's a lot of great call signs for the crew on Battlestar, like Racetrack and Husker and Chuckles. Now, sure. if, now if not D, but if Candice McClure was in the fleet, what would her call sign be? Anybody who's been at a convention where Tomo and I have been, I know Grace doesn't do a lot of um, conventions, but if you've ever been around me and Tomo, me and Grace, or even uh, Reka, Reka Sharma, mm -hmm. uh, Corey, uh, you know that we all call each other Muffin. Hmm. I hadn't heard that one before. <laughs> have you not heard that? No, I Oh, I see what, because Tom was never around. Um, that's probably not like the most appropriate call sign, but <laughs> it is my nickname. <laughs> now I know what to call you from now on. <laughs> it, it happened because for a period of time, uh, when I got my first apartment, I was baking a lot of muffins and mm. I would show up on set with like these breakfast muffins. I'd make these like ham and cheese breakfast muffins. <laughs> always giving people muffins i don't know now um after battlestar one of the other shows you're on was hemlock grove and uh, aaron douglas was on that as well since battlestar it seems such whenever i work with you guys it seems such a tight-knit cast as well as working with uh, aaron on uh, hemlock grove how much do you guys still stay in contact with each other i am actually like i am I am the wayward child of this family. <laughs> They're so patient with me, Sean Harry, um, because everybody is still like so close and keeps in touch with each other. You know, obviously the people that are in Los Angeles, um, I know see each other all the time. Um, up here in Vancouver, like I'm the worst. Like Reka has called me so many times to be like, let's go for a walk, let's hang out. And it's not that I don't want to, I just get caught up in all these things that are going on. Um, I know Trisha is here. Um, she's back here shooting. Uh, they've been hanging out. Like, I, I'm the worst. I am really the worst. But they always take me back and they're always checking on me. <laughs> they're mm -hmm. always like making sure I'm okay. Um, and yeah, I, they know everything that's gone on in my life. Uh, personally and professionally, I have gone to Eddie uh, last year, you know, last time I was in LA, I went to Eddie just, you know, for advice. Hmm. Um, that was not the first time. Um, yeah, we make sure that we're, we stay in contact with, with each other. If we haven't heard from each other for too long, you know, there's different connections. 
but we all make sure that we're keeping in touch and we know what's going on with everybody. Uh, I was over at AJ's house. It was uh, me, Reka, um, and Leah Cairns. We all went for pancake breakfast at AJ's house uh, the other day. I just got a message from from the chief, uh, from Aaron this morning. Like, we're in each other's lives. We we talk to each other and about each other all the time. Now, Kirsty, she's got another question. She wants to know, are you Team Billy or Team Apollo? I'm Team Billy. <gasps> Sorry, you should be happy to hear that. <laughs> I get it. Like, I get it. I know everybody was so mad at me, though. Like, Dean did Billy dirty. I was like, it wasn't me. <laughs> it wasn't me, guys. I was so invested in what that storyline was going to be. I was like, she's going to have the first kid in space. And we're like, it's going to be all these things. There's going to be a wedding. <laughs> like, um, yeah, listen, that storyline uh, with Apollo on the show, like, took took that character places that I didn't expect and um, paralleled a lot of what was going on in my life. I mean, I really grew up on that show in a lot of ways. I became an adult on that show, and a lot of those very adult experiences of relationships and arguments and separation and infidelity and all these kinds of things, I hadn't necessarily experienced in real life. I was doing it on the show first and then kind of doing it in my life where it was happening simultaneously. So as an actor, uh, I loved all that challenge. Also, I got to act with, with Jamie in every scene, you know? Yeah. And um, he's so good. Um, <laughs> it's just, well, he just switch, you know? He just like, he just embodied uh, uh, Apollo. Um, and so it was like a masterclass every time I got to work with him. Also, you know, Dee grew up, you know, she, she got married, she got a new uniform, she got to be an XO, like it was a whole new, it was a whole new world. But like in my romantic heart, it was Dee and Billy. <laughs> now, John Sheridan from Reading, he asks, do you think that civilizations are cyclical? Yes, I do. I think, I think we, it feels like we go through this process of remembering and forgetting. Hmm. And I hope that how it's working is that every time we remember, we remember a little bit more and we have access to a little bit more of ourselves uh, and we do it a little better <laughs> so that when it comes back around again, we sort of move the mark incrementally <laughs> before we have to start all over again. But I mean, can we talk about how this present moment is basically the prequel to that show? Like we are living the moments before, like, we are living the generation before Battlestar. <laughs> I mean, I hope not. I hope we don't all get destroyed by silence. <laughs> um, but I'm here for being bionic. So, <laughs> so transfer my consciousness. I'm, I, listen, if I'm so humbled as to be a prototype, sign me up. <laughs> now, Kath from Hampshire, she's written to us that as a viewer, I always get a kick out of seeing actors that I've enjoyed in a film or TV series turn up for the odd episode or two in a show I like. As an actor, how is it doing single episodes of a show? Is it different between shows in their first season or being on an established show? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, when, when you're coming in, you know, just for a guest star or um, a smaller reoccurring, you... You're a guest there, exactly as your title describes. You are a guest on that show. So your job is to, you know, be there, be aware of the uh, environment and the ethos of that show and the style and um, and and be in service to that. Uh, Leah, oh, I was just going to say, Leah and Tamo both said to me, they were saying on one show they guested on, they said that Supernatural 
was one of the most professional shows they've been on outside of Battlestar, and you've guested on that. So I take it you agree with them? Mm -hmm. Hands down. That show is a well-oiled machine. Mm. Um, and those two boys, <laughs> they're hilarious, by the way. Like, it, um, it's almost seamless watching them go... <laughs> Okay, the show is this machinery and it is going along and you come in and you just get kind of plugged into it. <laughs> and it's great. That's a great relief. Uh, everybody knows what they're doing and it's all, you know, you know what to expect. Your job is to just show up and, and uh, do the best you can play the role that you were cast for. Uh, but they, you know, to watch... Uh, <laughs> to to watch them like their their rapport off camera is the same as their rapport on camera it's just the words changed <laughs> and then as soon as it was cut they just like go right back to it <laughs> and it was like almost this background thing that they were on this tv show <laughs> just like continuing to be um the friends and colleagues that they actually are sometimes you know and I, you know, I like, you get to kind of be a fly on the wall in a way. You get to observe other actors and other processes. Um, eh, you're not doing any of the heavy lifting, you know, as, as a guest star. You, you come in, this is your lane, and you stick in it, and then you can hit crafty and grab lunch, and oh, you're on your way. <laughs> oh, it's no more crafty. Crafty is over. Mm. Um, Supernatural was great. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, running into my BSG alumni on other shows is always a delight. One of my favorite scenes uh, is Aaron Douglas and I sitting in that bar mm -hmm. uh, in Hemlock Grove. Yeah. Yeah. Now, another question from Kirsty. She says that Love Guaranteed was such a cute movie. And she wants to know, was it fun to work on? And did you get to keep any of those amazing outfits from it? No. <laughs> um, Love Guaranteed was so sweet. Shout out to Rachel Lee Cook. So the reason I got on that show is because I liked one of Rachel Lee Cook's pictures. <laughs> Uh, we're old friends and I hadn't seen her on Instagram in the longest time. She's not really, you know, she's on social media, but you know, she's got a family and all these things. And um, I, I saw her pop up on my feed. I was like, oh, Rachel, like, it's so good to see you. Uh, turns out she's doing this movie and she DMs me. Um, and she's, you know, she's like, oh, I'd love for you to take a look at this. And I read it and immediately it was so sweet and funny. And I thought it was just so charming. Um, and it, like, I love doing projects like that. I really didn't think anything of it kind of in a way. I was just happy that it ended up working out. It uh, worked out really well. You know, I had to go through all the processes, of course. It's not just in your DMs. You don't just get work in your DMs. Okay, let's no. just make that clear. <laughs> Do not DM other actors asking for work. <laughs> um, I think Mark well, Shepard probably does. <laughs> say it again? I think Mark Shepard probably does. Mm -hmm. okay, well, when you're Mark Shepard, I mean, what are you going to do? <laughs> Just smoldering everywhere you yeah. go. <laughs> it's the accent. Um, uh, and it was so easy. I, I showed up. It was all a bit on the seat of my pants. I was in Toronto. Um, my best friend did my braids like the night before. We finished at like two o'clock in the morning. My flight was at six and I had to be on set the same day. Um, I did my wardrobe on set before I kind of got there. It was all very last minute. But uh, again, you know, our crews here in Canada, particularly on that set, everybody's so professional. Everybody knows exactly what they're doing. They know exactly how this works. So you really can just like pop in from wherever you are and, um, and get it done. And I just loved, after doing so much genre, and as much as I love it, um, <laughs> um, 
I wanted some, I wanted a bit of levity and I wanted a bit of lightness and I wanted, uh, I wanted something that, um, more, like my baby cousins could watch and people could watch with their aunties and their grannies and not everybody wants to see blood and werewolves. Um, <laughs> so that was really lovely. And it was just a great experience. Um, Damon Wayne Jr. is incredibly sweet and so funny. He's so deadpan, but he's like, it had me in stitches in between takes. <laughs> I nearly fell down those stairs um, a couple of times because I was in four inch heels and that was exciting. Uh, but I just loved it. I loved being able to play, you know, powerful and self-possessed and kind of a B-I-T-C-H, but not. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you everybody for watching. I've gotten such great response from it. And um, yeah, I love that people love it. It's a good time for it. Now, uh, Tony asks, uh, he recently watched you in the 2002 remake of Carrie, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, which you also thought was better than the Chloe Grace Moretz version. Uh, had you seen the original before you worked on Carrie? And what do you remember about that shoot? Um, did I see the original? I did. I had seen the original. Well, it's one of Stephen King's most iconic films. Um, so the process of getting that role was actually kind of slightly traumatizing. <laughs> like, I went in for it. I auditioned five times. They called me back in five times. And I remember like finishing the last one, going through it. And they were like intense auditions. Like we were basically in the scene. Um, and then my agent called me back and he was like, they want you to come in again. And I was like, what do they want? I don't know what you want. <laughs> I don't know what to do. And then I didn't get it. Mm. I actually did not get the role. But they called me in uh, for the read through. They were like, you know, sorry, it didn't work out for Candace this time, but we'd love to have her in for the read through. And, you know, they pay you for the day. So I was like, yeah. Yeah, I'll take the change. Um, and then I finished the read through. And a couple of hours later, my agent called and was like, um, no, the next day, the mm -hmm. morning my agent called and he was like, you have to go to wardrobe. You're, you're playing this role. And he like did that deal on a park bench the night before. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, it, it was one of my favorite roles uh, of all time. Um, I had watched the original and to play the character of Sue Snell uh, to, to sort of, yeah. I mean, the original is so good. Um, also that they cast me, that Mark Stern was like, no, Sue Snell could be whatever color we decide her to be. Let's, you know, it, I really appreciated that. And it was a, um, it was a big break for me at the time. It was one of the most, it was one of the meteor roles that I yeah. had gotten to do at the time. And I really got to like, kind of express myself as an actor um, for the first time, um, not for the first time, but in, in a different way. Um, yeah. And then, uh, Angela Bettis, the, the pathos, uh, and that she generates in her work and the vulnerability that she brought to that role, uh, was an example to me. Um, and now I have this kind of lexicon of Stephen, of Stephen King things that I've been in. Some, yeah. are, some are better than, than others. I, I, will, I will say that. You always, make, <laughs> you always make anything you're in better, though, Candace. <laughs> Listen, shout out to David Anders, because um, we really just got through that film together. <laughs> uh, that's Children of the Corn. That's not Carrie. So. No. Adrian from Hastings, he's a big fan of hey, the TV show Haven, and he's just asking what it was like to guest star on that. What a lovely set, such a beautiful setting. We're out in uh, Nova Scotia. Um, eerie, 
it was it was it really was one of those places that is like bright and beautiful and friendly during the day and then as soon as it gets dark it's like a different mm. vibe <laughs> it was the first time i'd been on a set um that had a real family feeling to it uh not not the first well that i guest starred on that i came mm. into that had that same family experience um uh yeah you know, personally, Sean, um, not really relevant to the show. Um, I was going through a really difficult time yeah. uh, in my personal life while I was on that show. And um, I don't feel like I was totally present in that role. So it's a little bittersweet to me. Um, I'm, I'm so glad that people receive it. Uh, fans of the show obviously and uh i i'm so lucky to have continued to work with people from that show uh writers and producers and directors uh, that we're still in this business together we run we run into each other and we're like oh yeah haven um such a moment in time such an iconic uh show for canada at the time as well um but yeah a lot of it kind of blurred together to me um because of, of what I was going through personally and in my relationship. And I tried to give that to the role as much as I could, because as an actor, that's kind of what we get to do sometimes is like we can we can use these imaginary lives to kind of process our own personal ones. And um, that's sort of what I did with Haven and, and in that role. So I'm grateful to it. Uh, but it all, it all sort of blurred in my, mm. <laughs> in my mind after a time. <laughs> now, Johannes, who is from Germany, uh, they're a fan of the TV series Smallville, and they wanted to know what your experiences were like working on that. Mm. I was, like, in awe when I was on Smallville because it was such a big show already when I got to it. I was in the back, you know. I was one of the girls yeah. in the back, like... Um, I've never gotten to play a mean girl, so that was fun. I like the outfits. They were cute. <laughs> but I was just really observing. Like, I was, you know, I looked up to uh, Kristen and, and Allison on, on that show. They were examples, uh, particularly Kristen, of what um, uh, a, a woman of color or, you know, an ethnically ambiguous actress could accomplish uh, on television and types of roles. Um, also just, you know, how they were working, how they were interacting with the rest of the cast and crew, what it was like to be on such a massive network, such a visible show with all the like advertising and merchandising and all that kind of stuff to have that experience of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, there was no heavy lifting on that show, right? <laughs> I was just like there, and then I got to be kind of cheeky. I got possessed, and then <laughs> and then I was out. <laughs> I, I did meet some uh, some of my very good friends on that show, though. Um, Corey Lee, that I know to this day. Um, well, Christian Crook is a very private person. Mm -hmm. um, but she's very kind and I do know her. Um, and I love the work that she's doing on, on Burden of Proof. She's continued to work in this crazy industry all this time. And my hat's off to, to any of us who do. Yeah. Now, final final question we've got from Tony. He's got a, a few quick fire questions. That was good. Just to give some yes, no kind of answers to. So very quickly, Apollo or Billy? Billy. We established this. I mean, Apollo's butt, but like Pit Billy, right? right. <laughs> Vancouver, Durban, or London? <gasps> that is so hard. That's not fair. <laughs> That's not fair at all. <laughs> I, Durban every time. It's my hometown, guys. It's my hometown. Chocolate or ice cream? Chocolate. Film a scene with, fat, uh, with wearing a fat Apollo suit? Or make up a or a fat, uh, blah, 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 film a scene wearing a fat Apollo suit and makeup, or sat in a Cylon tank of uh, goo. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm in the Cylon tanker tanker of goo for sure because I'd be into that. Um, I 
I really liked Apollo's bat suit. I, I, well, I brilliant. Guys like me, we were like, bring it on. <laughs> I liked a little meat on the bone. So mm. it worked for me, actually. <laughs> Pepperoni or pineapple on your pizza? Pineapple. I know. Don't hate me, guys. I'm sorry. Really? Delicious. Do you arrive to the party too early or late? Late. Horror or sci-fi? Sci-fi. And the final one, human or Cylon? <gasps> Cylon. <laughs> Candice, I've got to say, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you for the oh. past. So well, good to see you, Sean Harry. Kind of like remind me how, like, also seeing you last February, it's remind me how much fun it is spending time with you. So we've got to try and get you back for a staff oh. year event once this lockdown and this pandemic is over. So so we can actually properly party. But we'll have you back soon. But thank you so much for spending some time with us. I uh, hope we see you soon. Also, a big thank you to Joe Leslie who uh, handled all the internet stuff for us to get that going so you take care candace and i hope we see you soon oh it was so lovely to see you sean harry thank you so much and yes i hope i see you real soon bye guys thank you